Okay, so now chapter two, we're going to start doing a little bit of basic chemistry. Um, what we need to know about chemistry to do some biology we're going to do. And so, of course, we start out with thinking what, first of all, what is matter? Matter, what is it? Is it stuff, right? Stuff you can basically touch, for example, is matter. Your desk is made of matter. Your coffee cup, if you drink coffee, is made of matter. Your pencil or pen is made of matter. It's made of stuff. It's basically anything that um, takes up space, and it can consist of anything that's a, of course, a, obviously a solid, a liquid, but also gases consist of matter. They're less they're not solids, they're less uh, physical, if you will, but they are still there um, around us. Um, so that's matter. Now, of course, matter at its most basic consists of atoms. Um, atoms are the basic building blocks of matter. Um, and I'm sure you've studied atoms in the past, and um, you've probably heard of these things, electrons protons and neutrons, they are the building blocks of atoms. We sometimes refer to these as subatomic particles, the particles that are basically inside the atom that comprise the atom. And they have this uh, general structure in that we have, of course, the center of the atom, what we call the nucleus. And there we have the protons and the neutrons. You can see the protons in red having a positive charge, and the neutrons having a neutral charge or no charge. And then surrounding the nucleus, we have these electrons. And you notice they have a negative charge. And they sort of move around the nucleus in what we call these orbitals. And they're moving extremely fast, and it's sometimes described as there's an electron cloud that surrounds the nucleus. Um, <clears throat> notice that we have sort of two layers here, an inner layer that has two electrons and an outer layer that has four. So we have sort of an inner orbital and an outer orbital. and it's not by accident that we have two on the inner orbital. That's sort of the maximum number of electrons we can have there. In the outer orbital, you notice we have four, so we can have more. And in outer orbitals, we can typically have um, as many as eight electrons in an outer orbital. This one only has four, so we would say it's not very full of electrons. But just remember that that inner orbital the most you're ever going to have is two electrons in that inner orbital, okay? And that E with a negative sign is my way of abbreviating electron. All right, we will, we will talk more about atoms. But there's just our simple, basic look there. Now, of course, there are different types of atoms comprising different types of elements, and here's our periodic table, which you've probably seen, I'm sure, or maybe somewhat familiar with. And when you take chemistry next year, you'll become very familiar with the periodic table. We're going to focus on particular elements that are of biological relevance. There are quite a few of these elements that you don't really find in living things, and so we don't concern ourselves with. Now, I mentioned uh, in class that in this chapter we'll be talking about carbon later, so that's a big one. Hydrogen, oxygen, and nitrogen. We sometimes describe those as the big four or chon. Sulfur is also important. Phosphorus is important. Um, those six in particular are the, the main elements that living things are made of. Um, going to let you think about for a moment, one of those elements by weight comprises the majority of your mass. And I'm just going to let you think about that right now. We'll talk about that later. 
Um, so now, let's think a bit more about elements and atoms. So here's that same image we just saw above. And you'll notice this one has six protons, six neutrons, and six electrons. And let's look up at our table. And you'll notice carbon here has the number six above it. That is the atomic number of carbon, okay? And you can, so you can see this guy down here has six of each, so this must be carbon, and sure enough it is. Now, one of these subatomic particles in particular is what makes carbon carbon. It is... In other words, you have to have six of the, this particular particle to make it carbon. And do you know which one it is? The electrons, protons, or neutrons? Well, it's the protons. When you have an atom with six protons, it is carbon. Nothing else. It's not possible to be anything else. When you have an atom that has seven protons, you have nitrogen. When you have eight, you have oxygen. When you have one, you have hydrogen. So it's the number of protons that defines what kind of element you have. And we, in particular, are going to remember our big four. That is, carbon has six protons. protons. Hydrogen has one. Oxygen has eight. Nitrogen has seven. Okay. Now, <clears throat> we can sometimes have particular elements that have isotopes, and carbon is a good example. So these are the three isotopes of carbon, what's uh, sometimes called carbon-12, carbon-13, and carbon-14. Now, you notice again the red dots are our protons, the blue are the neutrons, and the green are the electrons. And in each of these isotopes, you notice we have six protons. Indeed, each of these atoms is carbon. It's going to have six protons. But let's look at the neutrons. We saw above that carbon can have six neutrons. That's what we saw here. Ah, but sometimes carbon atoms have extra neutrons. And these three forms of carbon are the isotopes, carbon-12, carbon-13, carbon-14. Carbon-13 and 14, you might say, have, in this case, one extra neutron and two extra neutrons. In each case, you can see it's, they still have six electrons. Um, that can sometimes vary, although it doesn't often vary. But we can find variable number of neutrons, and those are the, new, the uh, isotopes. Um, now, you notice... Again, okay, so we've got the 12, 13, and 14. Where does that number come from? Well, we're basically taking the number of protons and adding them to the number of neutrons, and that gives us this larger number. Um, this is sometimes referred to as the mass number because it's related to the weight of the atom as well because the weight of an atom is comprised of the protons and the neutrons and the nucleus. Electrons have very little mass and don't add much to the weight of an atom. But the protons and neutrons together do. So these isotopes of carbon-13 and 14 here, with their extra neutrons, are slightly heavier than the carbon-12. And these are sometimes referred to as heavy isotopes. Again, these are all isotopes of carbon, but these two are the heavy isotopes because they have the extra neutron and they're slightly heavier. Now, um, the book talks about radioactive isotopes. And you can have, depending on the element you have, and the isotopes, they can be radioactive. What do we mean by that? What we mean is, for example, carbon-14 is a radioactive isotope of carbon. 
And when you have a radioactive isotope, what it means is it has a tendency to break down. That is, it loses some of those subatomic particles um, during the loss of those subatomic particles when a radioactive isotope is breaking down. It changes in form and it can release what we would refer to generally as radiation. Radiation. That is, these particles are lost as high energy particles that basically leave the atom, travel through space. By space I just mean the area outside the atom. And um, give it the properties of being radioactive, all right? Okay, we'll talk a little bit more about what that means in class. Okay, now atoms are not found just by themselves hanging out, at least not for very long periods of time. Atoms like to get together and basically form what? molecules, okay? And so two oxygen atoms like to get together to form oxygen. You can also get oxygen with hydrogen to form water. You can get carbon with hydrogen, four of them, to form methane. Sodium and chlorine like to get together to form sodium chloride or salt. Um, two hydrogen atoms like to get together to form hydrogen. And so molecules, of course, come in various shapes and sizes with variable numbers of atoms. The subscript, of course, tells you the number of any particular atom. We don't put a 1 here for sodium and chloride because by leaving that out, it's assumed it's a 1. So you never have the 1 there, but you'll have 2 or 3 or 4, which just shows you, again, that there are extras of that particular atom. Now, of these atoms I have drawn here, some of them in particular are what we call compounds. And does anybody know which of these? Some of these are compounds and some are not. They're all molecules, but some are compounds. Well, these three are in particular are compounds. The other two are not. Compounds, you have two or more different elements that get together. So sodium and chloride, two different elements getting together. Hydrogen, oxygen getting together. Carbon, hydrogen getting together. So they make compounds. These are just basic molecules that consist of the same um, elements, so they're not compounds. We'll see later C6H12O6, this molecule called glucose, a more complex compound consisting of three different elements. It's not always just two, it's two or more different elements getting together. Um, when atoms get together, they bond with each other. And there's different ways they can bond. There's what's called an ionic bond. And in the ionic bond, one atom takes an electron from the other one. And now it has an extra a uh, atom, I'm sorry, extra element. And the other one is now missing an electron. And when that chlorine, in this case, has taken that electron, it now has an extra negative charge and becomes negatively charged. The sodium has lost one of its negative charges and becomes positively charged. These are now known as ions. They are basically atoms or molecules with a charge. And it's that opposite charge that holds those two atoms together in an ionic bond. Okay, they're not sharing electrons, but one is taken. They have opposite charges now, and they're held together. In covalent bonds, two atoms share electrons, and they're typically sharing a pair of electrons, or sometimes, or though sometimes they can share multiple pairs of electrons. And the electron is basically moving between the two different atoms, okay? It's spending time on each of those two different atoms. Now I'm running out of time in this video, but we'll talk in the video about how that sharing is not always equal. 